Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. Uh, before I bring Miriam on, I do want to give you guys a um, viewer discretion warning. So if you and I'll put it in the description below after uh, after we get finished. But uh, if you have young people that tend to watch this channel with you, um, I want you to use discretion. It, this is a very important message for them. Um, but this is a no holds barred, uncensored live interview. And we're not going to do the traditional talk and code YouTube thing, right? The the essay or crimes of that nature, that sort of thing that we did with like the Danny Masterson case. We're not going to do that. We're going to let Miriam tell her story the way she wants to tell her story uh, in a no holds barred uh, manner. All right. So there may be issues that arise tonight that are going to be there will be issues arise that will be sensitive. There may be issues arise that are upsetting to some viewers. So please uh, use your discretion uh, as you watch this video. Um, the only promise I will make to you guys will be um, that if you have questions specific for Miriam, uh, the only way, so I'm not going to be watching the chat and my my mod that can get into the backstage is on the road right now, so they, she's not able to get into the back to the backside necessarily to start those comments. If you want to, if you have a question directly for Miriam, please send that as a super chat. It doesn't have to be a hundred dollars; can be ninety nine cents, whatever. That's the only way I can guarantee tonight that you all have, will have the opportunity to have your questions addressed because this could go a couple hours, and there's going to be thousands of chats that I'm not going to be able to keep up with. So, all right. So I think she's ready. Let me bring her in. Hi, Zach. Good evening, Miriam, and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having uh, me I on did, to I chat did tell with you. I, I did tell our audience that there will likely be some some subjects and some topics tonight that are sensitive and maybe triggering to some viewers. So I did ask them to use their discretion um, in, in watching that. And I also made them the promise over, over the last couple of days that I would uh, do my best efforts to keep my big lawyer mouth out of the way and let you tell your story uh, your way. And based on the research I've done, um, you, you, of course, did an interview with the after, uh, first uh, Leah Remini in the Aftermath um, TV show or uh, mm -hmm. Scientology, Leah Remini in the Aftermath, whatever it was. You but could. of course, as is standard in pre-recorded television, that was edited both for time and for content. And uh, I, I can't find too many platforms where you've been ever, ever been able to tell your story, the order you wanted to tell it in, for, whether that's chronologically or situationally from beginning to end in an uncensored, um, unedited fashion. You know, may it, it only a handful of times, if that many. So this is, uh, this is an opportunity, I think, for those who are familiar with your story to become more familiar with it and those who have heard of you tangentially through the SBTV community to hear your story um, in its entirety. Uh, and the the description I put for it was um, uh, uh, Miriam Francis Uncensored uh, gr uh, growing up in the cult, leaving the cult um, in your path to recovery because it is an ongoing, uh, it is an ongoing recovery. So um, folks, without, uh, without further delay, please help me welcome Miriam Francis uh, to the channel. A lot of you may be familiar with her. Um, and I'm going to do my best to do an interview that keeps me out of the way. Um, we are streaming this to Miriam's audience as well. So for those of you who don't know, I am your lawyer friend, Zach. Miriam has graciously agreed uh, to come on and tell her story to me. Um, she's in high demand. Lots of people probably want to hear her story, but she's agreed to come on and tell it to me. So for those of us here at your lawyer friend, Zach, uh, in the Zach Pack community, as they refer to themselves, uh, thank oh, you Zach for, for trusting me. Yeah. Thank you. Well, and I want, you know, thank you for trusting me and my community. Uh, to tell your story. Yeah. So what, if you would, why don't you tell us, um, uh, as I understand, I believe you're a second generation Scientologist. Tell us um, your, how you ended up in the, uh, in the organization, what your various roles were and what your life looked like uh, at a, as an adolescence uh, or as an mm -hmm. adolescent, uh, including how you ended up uh, in the U S. Okay. So we'll go back. Let's go back in time um, to Sydney in Australia in 1984. So at that time, my parents, um, they had both been working for, uh, they've been working for Scientology in Adelaide. And I don't know too much about their Scientology history in Adelaide, but I do know that they were both involved uh, first through Scientology in Adelaide. And then they moved to Sydney to join the Sea Organization. And then that's where I was born. So what they were doing back then was to place the baby straight into the full-time care of the Sea Organization. And you were now going to be a future Sea Org member. That was your, from the moment you were born, your entire 
rest of your life was laid out for you. So it's been referred to as a baby factory. And essentially, um, you know, that's, that's what it was like because children weren't being born to be part of a family unit. Um, there was minimal, you know, sort of family, things that you would consider to be traditional family, you know, family experiences um, we, we didn't have. So they placed us into the care of this. Um, well, basically there would just be one person like looking after a bunch of babies. And then, um, and I was in that from birth until uh, I was three years old. And then when I was three years old, my mother then relocated to the U S um, and at that time, then uh, my father left working for this church of Scientology for uh, up until 1990. So uh, there was a few years there where um, a couple of years, two and a half years, I think. Um, yeah. Where he, um, yeah, just sort of uh, was sort of out in the, still a Scientologist. And, um, and I, and I have a lot of memories from that time period. Um, and yeah. And memories of what Australia was like, for me, um, you know, remembering my, my country and, um, you know, the tie to, to where you're from, like that, you know, I had that connection. And then in 1990, uh, my father relocated myself and my brothers and, and his self. And yeah, we went to the U S so, um, that was 1990. Now at that time, my mother was, uh, she was working for international management. So she was actually working at a confidential location. And so at that time, again, we were placed into this, you know, child factory. Um, I describe it as like the place where they kept the kids or the, the place where they kept the children, because it was just basically like a holding area for while your body grew is essentially what it was. And it was minimal care. So it was food and a roof over your head. Um, at night we slept in cots and um, and I didn't have contact with my parents for the first few months because uh, after arriving, because my father was placed um, into his like Sea Org training that he had to do. And that can take, you know, at least a couple of months. So there was probably like at least I said three months, but like maybe two, three months. I, I couldn't tell you how long for exactly that. Um, yeah, every night I was sleeping on those cots in that building. Um, and um yeah. And my, my mother, yeah, not having access to my mother because she was at this confidential location. So, yeah. When you, when you say the confidential location, is that the, uh, uh, <laughs> the, the international management base up in Gillen hot Springs? Is that what you're referring to? That's correct. Yes. So for people that were inside Scientology, we weren't allowed to know where that was. It was top secret. And even if you were a child of a parent, um, that, worked there you weren't allowed to know because you didn't have the certain clearances that you needed um and if you did get those kind of clearances they would relocate you so you would go to a a child place nearer to that um but it required uh you to be very like highly ethical and i was quite a rambunctious kid i was quite rebellious especially as i grew so like you know by the time i was like 11 years old, um, you know, like I just, yeah, I wasn't meeting what their requirements were. Um, and so, um, and, and also it wasn't just me though. Um, yeah, at the time, because you, you, well, you had to have both parents at this international location and my father had been on clearance lines is what they called it is where you get, you do confessionals and you, um, you do, I don't know, certain, like maybe there's resulting handlings from that or whatever you have to address. And then they, they check if you're qualified or not. And it's a whole process. Um, and so, so he hadn't met those qualifications, um, to go up to international level. And, um, yeah, so we just stayed, um, us kids, we stayed at the Los Angeles area where they kept the children. 
um, for most of the time. Mm-hmm. So, so one of the things that Aaron Smith Levin is has been saying for a long time is that Scientology is a family destroying cult, and a lot right. of people interpret that to mean um, their disaffiliation policy or the declaring of a person to be a suppressive person and the forced disconnection from family. But I think there's a significant argument that the family destroying aspect of it began almost in infancy for you. Yes, correct. Um, throughout, because. Scientology views humans as simply vessels of labor to achieve the goals of clearing the planet. Although that's, you know, a sort of a, a logical fallacy. They view, they well, view the human body be, as, as mm-hmm. labor. Let me be more specific on that. Um, Cause that's important. So in the C organization, the C organization is the administrative body. So let's, you know, you could compare it to like a clergy or that sort of thing. They're the members that have the greatest amount of dedication for it. They're the members who have signed billionaire contracts. So that's a labor force and it's a labor force that it has an indefinite contract. Your contract never ends. Um, and so that in the C organization, that's what I was born into. And that's the differentiation, because if you're just like a regular Scientologist, um, largely you're on the receiving end of services. So you're paying for services, you're attending, you're doing a course, um, you're doing their brand of counseling, you know, Um And so, but you have free will in that you can, you're not working for them. So to that degree, you're not, you know, you're not employed by them. There's another level there, which is Scientology staff. So that's a a lesser commitment because it's usually like a two year or five year contract. And these are not billionaire contract people. So that's the differentiation there. Um, But yes, so, but for the children that were placed in it, that was their destiny as soon as they were at whatever age they arrived many of us were born, literally born and then placed there. And then there's plenty that, you know, children that came from many different countries as they recruited more people um, from those countries. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. Yeah. And those children, so as soon as you arrived, then that was going to be, you know, that was all you were, your worth um, was based on the amount that you could produce. From that point forward for Scientology. Yeah. You know, for, for those of us on, on, on the, in the free world, for those of us on outside the Sea Org and people like me who were not born into or never had a family member in Scientology. So having to learn about it as an outsider in the free world, there is an inherent value given to the nuclear family unit. There is a unique value given to husband and wife. There is a unique value given to parent and child whatever that relationship looks like. Obviously Scientology Mm -hmm. has absolutely no value, sees no value in that because Mm -hmm. they, uh, Sea Org members produce babies. Those babies are essentially put into a holding pen. And then the married, the married couple, in this case, your mom and dad, your mom was moved to Gilman hot springs and your dad was left with the kids in Australia for yes. some, or at least some of the kids for some period of time before you mm-hmm. all were able to relocate. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, there is some, there is an inherent value given for those who are a reasonable people to that relationship. But Scientology simply sees those beings, those humans as vessels of labor, at least from the science, from the, from the Sea Org perspective, vessels Correct. of labor. Is that, do you think that's an accurate description? That that is an accurate description, um, particularly for the Sea Org children. There's a Hubbard quote, and he said, and so this was a, this was a view that he largely held in regards to society. So that would include everyone. That was his view of children, you know, everywhere, regardless of whether they're in Scientology or not. But um, but the Sea Org is where it was utilized, where his words were utilized in that way in creating children into assets. But the quote is that he said, um, he mocks society and he said, oh, society um, treats these children or the, society believes these children are dear little cute things. God damn them. That's the quote. And um, and he said that, in fact, they are assets. So they're not, you know, these, you know, sweet children that we should um, he didn't believe that you should differentiate your treatment for children 
from how you would treat an adult, that there should be no difference. And actually that you were doing a disfavor to the child if you were to treat them as a child. In fact, growing up, the, the uh, label of child was a derogatory term. So I was labeled a child up until I became a what, what they called cadet, um, which a cadet is just, you know, a term that was used to transition you into a higher um, degree and um, an amount of labor, basically. So um, when you're a cadet, you then hold a position and you get some privileges. Um, so for example, you would get um, one night a week, we would get a movie night if our, if our production level was up. So everything was based on our production level. And I transitioned from being a child. And again, remember, a child is something that you do not want to be. The, the, the Hubbard writings are just filled with disgust for children. You don't want to be a child. So you want to be a cadet, right? And so I transitioned from child to cadet at 11 years old. Now, and when you, it, when you, yeah. when you were finally able to come to the U S several years or some period of time after your mom came, I believe your dad um, brought, brought you and some of some or all of your siblings to the States, if yeah. I recall correctly, and some people may know this and I, I'm, you know, you and I had a, just for full disclosure, about a week ago, Miriam and I had about an hour long conversation in preparation for this so that I could identify the way she wanted to tell her story. Um, so I didn't come in here cold. So some of this I know, some of this I don't know. I'm sort of learning some of this with with the viewers as well. But as you, when you came to the United States, if I recall correctly, you did not come here through a traditionally documented process. Is that I mean, essentially, you were here illegally at some period of time. Is that is that yes. accurate? Yes, from 1990 to 1998, I was there illegally. So we entered the U.S. Um, just on passports. And that's often the case with Scientology. And then what they'll do, I mean, I don't know, I can't speak to what they do, you know, today, 2024. But certainly in that time period, that was what was happening. So you would ent enter the U.S. with your passport and then then you were a problem, but then you could begin to um, address it. And then they would just put it under, you know, religious worker status um, but I do recall many times we would do trips to the immigration office in downtown Los Angeles. And, um, you know, I remember having to get immunization shots and it was a long process. It went on for years and years. So what happens is, um, yeah, I, so when I became a cadet, I was entitled to $15 a week pay because you're working six days, six and a half days a week you're working. You're also do, you have, um, you know, allocated time for Scientology studies, and then you have an allocated time for, to learn reading, writing, and some basic maths. Um, but that was, that's generally, that was the limit on what your education was going to be, because that was all that was necessary to be a Sea Org member. Um, and, but yeah, so I, and so even though I had started working and I held a position, um, as a cadet would, um, I was not being paid for it because I didn't have social security. And also like, how do you pay an 11 year old? I don't know, but that they were children of that age. They were receiving a $15 a week, um, salary. Yeah. For working six and a half days. Mm-hmm. And, and I think there's at least the lawyer in me says there's absolutely an argument to be made that if you were brought here with full knowledge and intent, not with your knowledge, but with the organization's full knowledge and intent of you becoming a Sea Org member and you, mm -hmm. one, were not of age to legally work in the United States and two, um, were brought here without your consent or without the ability at that age, you don't have the legal ability to consent. We have a legal term for that. We call that labor trafficking. Correct. There's a yes. That's labor trafficking. You were yeah. So I was brought to the U.S. when I was six years old in 1990. Yeah. And um, yeah. And so six years old, there's no there's absolutely no way you could understand anything like that. And then um, and then so I was in their child system, which is really a child grooming system. You're absolutely being groomed for labor. There is no doubt about it. You're you're told that you have no future other than to do this. Um, and so anything that you were interested in, like I was interested in being a writer. And so I was told, um, you know, well, you can't do that. You're going to be a Sea Org member. And then, and then I was like, well, can't I do that? <laughs> like in my spare time. And they were like, no, you don't have, to have spare time. Just, you know, you just had to, to, you know, get used to the idea that 
this is what your future was going to be, particularly for the children whose parents were in the C organization. Now, sometimes there was an opportunity when one parent would leave and then suddenly you, you have an opportunity for a home on the outside. But I didn't, I never, that opportunity for me never came because my parents were in it the whole time. Um, and also then you have the factor as well that they have no personal resources themselves. They have no money. They have no property. They have no where to go if they have been imported in from another country, as was the case for me. So again, you have all these compounding circumstances. You know, I didn't have um, any kind of like a familial structure outside of my parents in the U.S. So, you know, usually you'd have your, you know, aunts, uncles, um, maybe you have grandparents to go to. Um, but that was not, none of that was available to me. So for a child being brought in from another country into that circumstance, it's very difficult because you cannot leave. You can't leave that country. You don't have the money and neither does your parents. And I definitely came into that situation. We'll get to that bit later on. But there was, um, when, when I was trying to leave later on as a teenager, it was like, I had nowhere to go. And it was a real issue. It went on for a couple of years. Yeah. Eventually, I was able to get out. Well, you talk about the the education or the lack thereof. That's really, really typical in high control groups. By controlling what you have access to and what you learn, it allows mm -hmm. them. I mean, if you if you were given basic reading and arithmetic skills, and that's simply it, because that's I mean, from a very mm -hmm. technical perspective, with those two skill sets, you can sort of survive. You can read what you need to read, and you can do the the math necessary to pay the bills, and that's sort of mm -hmm. what you needed to do. Not pay your bills, by the way, pay their bills, but a different a different issue, right? Um, but mm -hmm. without the without the context of worldly knowledge, without the context of history, without the context of, you know, literature and, and all these other, these powerful things that'll, that enlighten us to the world outside our little bubble, you don't understand that there are things out there. So when you end up in this situation 10 years later, trying to leave the organization, you don't have the requisite knowledge necessary to even have a conversation with somebody who's trying to help you. Um, and, and so, you know, one of, one of my moderators is, uh, is a PhD candidate in political science. And, you know, she discusses some, discusses things like this, um, from time to time, but also in not, it, it's never a justification, but it, it, it provides context to, um, yes. how you ended up being a victim of childhood sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. At the end of probably the worst perpetrator of all. And if you want to tell that story, I will give you the opportunity. But if you're not ready to share that, that's certainly your story to tell and not mine. But you are, by any definition of childhood, a victim of childhood sexual abuse. Right. All right. So um, one thing that I want to, before we get into that, um, sorry, you just, you just sort of like, I, I was, was not, I was not thinking we were going to get there and I was thinking about something else um, well, I mean, if, if, that if you were saying go, before. If you want to go down a different avenue, it's your story. If you want to go down a different path for a while and, and lay some context, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not going to dictate no, no. the way we do this. No, it's totally fine. I just wanted to touch on the fact to add the context there is that you also were not allowed to tell anybody that you wanted to leave. Because so that, that you makes it depressive, right? It was treasonous, yes. And also it could lead to being declared a suppressive person. That is correct. So you weren't allowed to tell a friend that you wanted to leave. You weren't allowed to tell a parent that you wanted to leave. You weren't allowed to tell anybody except for like a uh, an, an ethics person. Um, so they were in the ethics department. You, then they would be trying to handle that one-on-one -on -one with you, which means that they would, what ethics is, what that whole section is in Scientology is all the reprogramming techniques basically is what that is. It's like, okay, so you're, you're saying you want to leave or you're saying that you've been sexually assaulted. Like for example, in the Jane Doe one's case, particularly in the Danny Masterson trial, she, that's a really sort of great public example. Um, if anyone's paid attention to that, but she went through this, you know, horrific level of this ethics reprogramming. And they were in fact, the, the handler, the ethics officer, which was Julian Swartz was telling her that she couldn't say the word rape in her report when she was describing what had happened to her. Um, and so, and then what he was doing was these different, um, you know, what they call conditions. It, yeah, it's just a reconditioning. The, all the ethics tools that he was using on her, they're very, very commonly used and they were being used and they still are today being used against children um, constantly. This is the ethics 
any any person who had anything to do with Scientology will tell you that the ethics was always there. There was, I don't, you couldn't avoid it. And for me, um, being someone who wasn't always following the rules, uh, certainly the ethics handlings was like a very real re reality to me. So what I'm, what I want to speak to is the level of control that you have, um, where you cannot speak freely, and if you do. Um, there's punishments, there's consequences of that you're very well aware of. And um, so there's a constant threat over you as well. And then if you do kind of fall out of line, then they're going to correct you and they're going to recondition you and they're going to make you, um, they're going to tr try and change the way that you think about things. The other huge layer is the language. Um, so because Hubbard has all these different replacement words for things, you know, very 1984, George Orwell, um, Newspeak, you know, where everything was opposite type thing, like freedom is slavery, you know, war is peace, all those sorts of things. That's very real. That's Hubbard's words. Um, and, um, you know, there's so many complexities to it. So I'm just trying to like hit on some of the very major ones. And the other one that is very significant is that your emotions were controlled. And so you were allowed to be below a certain um, level of emotion. So anything other than just being like interested and cheerful was not acceptable. Um, and so you're constantly trying to manage your own emotions. Meanwhile, you're, yeah, it just, it's just like, I mean, how, do, how does a child cope with all of that? There's, you know, it's very difficult. Um, and so a lot of us adults, um, well, I'll say some of us, um, certainly I think a lot of them would say that they have had, and I, I've definitely experienced, like it's, you know, trying to relearn or trying to learn how to regulate emotions in a healthy way and not have it just freak us the hell out. Like there's definitely been, there was years there. I think I'm only just recently, um, because I'm working with a counselor and she's really great. And so she's teaching me to, um, she's a mental health counselor that is tied into like supporting me for my criminal case, which we'll get to in a minute. But she's teaching me to sort of like, you know, come into the moment and which it's funny because in Scientology, it's like they have a term for that as well. But this is more of like a natural thing. And I don't know, just to to not get um, to not let my emotions freak me out and scare me because I wasn't allowed to feel them as a child and I didn't know how to, to manage them. What? Well, what, what you're expressing, I have a, I have a five-year-old and one of the things that we work with them on uh, regularly is how do you handle big feelings? It's okay to have big mm. feelings, but your entire life up until your, I mean, your thirties and forty, I mean, you know, late thirties, even you've mm -hmm. been told, you're well, I mean, I guess up until you left, you're not allowed to have big feelings. You're only allowed to have these little feelings and only this specific set, set yes. of little feelings. Big yes. feelings mean you are not in control. And if you're not in control, we are going to remediate you until you are in control. And I know you have a background um, having mm -hmm. been assigned to the Rehabilitation Project Force, which we'll get to at Correct. the next time. And so here you are really 25, 30 years delayed in trying to develop these skills and it's having to rebuild your psyche. It's having to rebuild your emotional body that was stunted by no fault of your own because you happened mm -hmm. just by sheer happenstance. Life took a bad bounce and you were born into this organization. Um, and we mm -hmm. see that uh, often with people who are in high control groups. Most of them aren't nearly as violent or as mm -hmm. large as at least the Scientology was. It's, you know. Um, you know, the, the math on it's pretty clear, but, uh, it, it's, it, to me, I find it uh, as somebody who never grew up in that, in that world, I recognize it's hard for me to say, oh, we'll just work through it because I have that skill set because my parents taught me that skill set when I was six, mm -hmm. you did, you had to learn that skill set on your own, probably through paid therapy 30 years after the fact. And that goes it to show the long term <laughs> these organizations cause. Yeah. So, and, and fortunately this, um, particular, like this mental health support that I'm getting, um, which is in relation to my criminal case in Australia, um, that's fortunately free. And I would encourage anyone, um, if you're in Australia and you're listening, there are, um, 
So there is a lot of support. If you don't know where to start, you can call 1-800-RESPECT. But there's also um, there's also specific sexual assault, which is the one that I'm going to um, like counseling organizations. So look into um, one in your local area. And also, I know that's the same in the U.S. Um, where, if like for example, again, if you don't know where to start and you just want to pick up a call, uh, pick up a phone and have a conversation and just ask questions, um, you can call Rain, which is R A I N N, and uh, that's the website. Um, yeah, if you just Google that, R-A-I, R-A-I-N, and I don't have their phone number to hand right now, but are you looking that up? I am. I'm going to put that on screen in just a minute for our folks. Yeah, so they um, they specialize in, um, you know, sexual trauma and assisting, you know, it's that, it's that starting point, like just having someone to talk to, and it's an easy way to do it if you can just pick up a call, uh, pick up a phone, and um and, you know, like they can refer you to a local organization in your area um, and they can give you some advice as well. Yeah. Yeah. So that's 800-656-HOPE or 800-656-4673. And um, you can also do their online chat where it says the chat now button. Um, so this is really, really great for, yeah, so it's the National Sexual Assault Hotline free, confidential, and 24-7. In um, every country, um, well, most countries do have a type of hotline like this. Yeah, available. Um, okay, so we, I think we were talking about a few things. So emotions, okay, so that's really important. And, and segueing to the sec sexual abuse is that I, I experienced significant trauma um, from a child, as a child, from three years old to about eight years old, and repeated trauma by one particular offender who was my father. And um, I, and so you, you understand if like, when I'm experiencing that, but I'm not allowed to express, to express appropriate emotion about it. That's, that's incredibly damaging, because I wasn't able to talk about it. I wasn't able to that emotion was not okay for me to feel. I wasn't allowed to feel angry. I wasn't allowed to feel grief about it. So uh, those emotions I've experienced as an adult, um, you know, rather than in the time that I should have experienced it. And I did sp experience it to some degree, but it was absolutely, it was, you know, reserved and, um, and it would come out in ways that were more like, um, not controlled. Um, so, um, for example, when I was about 14 years old, I used to just lock myself in the bathroom and just cry, um, during course time. I was supposed to be on course. And at that time I was a Sea Org member. I joined the Sea Org at 13 years old. And, um, and, and so I would just do it like, like secretly just cry by myself. So it's not a natural, like you should be able to perhaps talk to a friend about it. And, um, and, um, that was just really stifled for me. And, um, but, but eventually like slowly, but surely I found that voice inside me and it got louder and got louder. And eventually the words came out of my mouth, you know? And, um, yeah, so it's just been a long journey a long journey with that. Um, yeah. So, so one of the things that Scientology has, um, has a, a long storied history of doing is when people like you, um, go and you've, you've always said, I reported early. I reported often. I told anybody who would listen that this Correct. happened to me, um, mm -hmm. with, within the organization and Scientology mm -hmm. has a long history of saying, Oh, it didn't happen. Or if it did, it's protected by here in the States, we call it the pastor prisoner privilege, right? Any confession you come to your religious leader and, and make that that is protected um, under mm -hmm. our First Amendment and some other some other like uh, statutory and case law here in the States. But you and I had a conversation where, you know, it's almost gaslighting. You keep saying, no, this didn't happen or you're not allowed to say that or we're not going to believe you or we have no mm -hmm. proof other than you telling me. And then at some point you discover that a confession has been made. Right. By, okay. By your by your abuser. Mm -hmm. I don't want to I don't want to give a name to the abuser. I think I think it it empowers the abuser. Um, but your abuser admits to this wrongdoing. And then mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, where it gets really really tricky sometimes uh, in Scientology is this was made to an auditor. 
However, comma, however, it was not done in it. As I understand it, it was not done in an auditing session. And that is Correct. significant, significant under U.S. law, because if it was done in an auditing session, which for those who don't know, is Scientology's version of essentially therapy and counseling and you know pastoral support or clerical support, that's protected. But sometimes you have to see auditors for other reasons. And one of those is called a security check. And they call that a sec check. Mm -hmm. And that, that sec check occurs, as I understand it, when you go to the finally get to the right person or enough noise is made, this thing happened to me. Mm -hmm. And then they bring in your abuser. You need to talk about this. But they put the but that has to be in front of a trained auditor to interpret the data. And mm -hmm. your abuser admits the wrongdoing during a sec check. That is not protected religious practice. That's no right. different than so, the police department. Talk about that. Yeah. So let me tell you the sort of, I'll, um, some of that you've got right and some of that is not correct. So I will just sort of explain it more in a sequence. Um, Please do. And, and so, and so first I will say, like, I'll, I'll start here and then I'll go backwards. But like, uh, first I'll say that the Church of Scientology has never publicly denied my allegations against my father. And in fact, they had provided statements to um, Scientology, Leah Remini, and the, sorry, Leah Remini, Scientology in the Aftermath show that I participated in. Now, um, I've recently found out that that was a verbal statement. It wasn't a written statement, which is very strange because um, all of the other contributors had written statements written on them. Anyways, it's a, it's a little bit of a contested topic at the moment. Apparently I was the only one that received a verbal statement. Okay, well maybe because it's a sensitive matter, sure, fine. But the um, the lawyer for the show wrote it down on a card and then they put that card up on the show, which said that, um, you know, it would show them admitting to it. Um, so anyways, that's a whole nother topic. We won't go into too much of detail with that. But I just wanted to say that they have not attempted to deny that that happened. And they haven't created any, like they didn't, they never created a, a hate website on me. They, um, you know, I, I, they didn't go after me for those allegations. And okay, so let's go back in time. So so I'm a child um, in this child system. This is before I joined the C organization. At this time, okay, I want to go back to when I was eight years old. So as I said before, I experienced the um, really, it was, so it was sexual battery. So it was sexual assault up to about eight years old. And of course, I can't, you know, certain date that because um like I remember my seventh birthday very vividly but I don't remember an eighth birthday and so that's really I don't remember a ninth birthday either or a tenth birthday or an eleventh birthday because these things were not always celebrated um or they were celebrated in a very minimal way um I think perhaps I got um yeah, so it, that's it's hard. It's difficult to like sort of pinpoint exactly, but um, but as far as I understand it, because now there's been a couple of other witnesses that have come forward with information who worked in the organizations with um, or uh, near my father, and so more information has come forward. So as I understand it, in terms of the sequence of things that happened, um. So after I arrived to the U.S., I was put in the child system, but then um, usually on the, so one night a week on the weekend, um, after my father had finished his training and then he was now a full Sea Org member, he could then take the kids and take them to, he was allocated a room. At that time, it was at the Anthony building, which was on um, Fountain, actually it's still there, that building's still there um, in Los Angeles. And, um, and so we'd have one night over in his room um there was another building called the wilcox which is where the staff of um if you worked for celebrity center you lived at the wilcox and um and that was in hollywood um which was the old wilcox hotel that building is still there today too it's called something else and it's not sea org owned or scientology owned anymore but um, but at those two locations, there was an incident at each of those locations. So this would be in the early 90s. So, um, you know, again, I couldn't date it exactly. Uh, but um, yeah, so so at those, so there was an incident at one, so at the Anthony building. And then according to the records that are in his personnel fo folder, um, that, 
So what I'm trying to say is that there, there's a number of things that happened. There was some actions that took place that were under the, the Scientology counseling banner, but that information ended up in his personnel folder. Uh, because when you're going through this qualification process, they have to, um, you know, have all this information. So, um, okay. So, so he, so there was an incident and then he gets a handling. They do a Scientology handling with him and whatever, trying to like cure him of his predatory nature. And that doesn't work because uh, then another incident takes place at the Wilcox and um, then they try and do another handling again. And so that information is, is in his personnel folder. Now, when he's going through the qualifications lineup or whatever, he's doing these confessionals then some years later, um, then they they find more, they find further incidents, uh, or at least they have him do a handling. So he comes to me, I'm at this ranch location, which is in Saugus, California, or Santa Clarita. And, um, and now I'm a cadet there. And he comes and visits me and he has this like set thing that he has to do, like this kind of handling where he comes and confesses to me. Now that portion of it, as I understand, was what he those incidents he was confessing to were incidents from Australia, and that portion of it, I believe, was garnered through um, security check um, as part of this qualification process. So yes, again, so and you are correct that the security check he is not under the same banner as this religious protection of this um, priest penitent privileged information, and um, and what they would do is they would then have a you do a handling as a result of the things that you confess to. So he comes to the ranch. I'm 12 years old, and he comes and tells me in person, like I did this to you back in Australia. Da 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 da. Um, and I was, you know, obviously not equipped to deal with that conversation it was very, um, traumatizing for me. And then he just went off on his merry way and continued being a Sea Org member. And yeah, so they have at least four incidents in their records and, um, and those four incidents are not, that information is in the folders, in the files for him, not under privileged, um, information. They're not confidential. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so then. Well, the significant, so I don't mean to interrupt. The significant part of that, no, from my not. perspective as a lawyer looking at this, is that file is therefore, that personnel file is therefore subject to subpoena power. Right. The auditing records yeah, may, may not be. But mm -hmm. um, the, the personnel file and the information in there is absolutely subject to subpoena power, whether through civil litigation or through the long arm of the federal government, primarily the FBI, if in the Department of Justice, if they issue a subpoena, then it then it's 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 uh, possibly life changing for you and many other victims like you. But that's that's a different discussion I'll do on a different video. Mm hmm. Yeah. And so um, I guess so. the thing, the trouble for me is that I need I need a lawyer in order to do that. Um, and yeah. Um, that is the trouble. And I'm in Australia and obviously lawyers cost money. And I know there's, um, you know, there's contingency and whatever, like it's just, I, I just don't have access to the resources. Um, there is someone who um, is, you know, going to be helping me. Maybe I, I as far as I under, understand it, and this is still very confusing to me, I have asked a lawyer to look into what we do, do the statute of limitations still stand in terms of a civil issue for me and I'm, I'm waiting for an answer back so uh i mean yeah it just it's everything's slow and i'm like the the time is ticking because i i as i understand it just from my like google research that i have until my 40th birthday and that's in september this year so i'm like i don't know i'm like i just i just i don't know for me it's like it's i'm like i'm confused um there's so much going on. I, I don't know if I have the resources that I maybe need to have in order to really bring a case, if that makes sense. Yeah. So from this, from the civil side, that, that, that does make sense. There are, um, mm -hmm. obviously this would be a contingency fee case because you would be suing for money damages. Um, but the problem is, and this is where some of the strongest cases never go to litigation. The mm. lawyer, it has to be a lawyer who has the skill set to have a strong success, a, a, a high success or a high chance of having successful outcome. Mm -hmm. But that law firm also has to have 
the capital, the money to invest yes. in these investigations and to pay. If I subpoena something from the government, they are allowed to charge me to make copies. If I subpoena mm -hmm. a, a Scientology, the law allows them to charge me a set amount of money to generate these documents because it's in theory costing them money to make copies or whatever. It's a nonsense law, but it is what it is. Mm -hmm. But also to hire experts, to file the lawsuit, to figure out ways to communicate when you're at 17 hours difference. Yeah. And then when it comes time to it, to either fly you to the U.S. to participate in the discovery process or to dispatch a lawyer to you in Australia. So it can be done, but you've got to have the right lawyer. You've got to have have the right firm and there have to be the right assets and resources in place. And I think this is a conversation you and I should have later sort of separate mm -hmm. from this. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I've sort of been shopping anonymously uh, sort of the 10,000 foot version of your facts through the legal community to see if I can find the right combination of attorney firm and resource to try and tie mm -hmm. that together. Um, but that's, that's a different conversation for a different day. Um, and then you have, I know reported this to the Los Angeles police department, the LAPD. Correct. And, yeah. And in fact, you uh, it, at some point um, in the future may have a conversation with the L.A. County prosecutor who is assigned to your case and mm -hmm. ultimately the prosecutor, the, the prosecutor's office declined to prosecute the case. And as you understand it, as you've conveyed to me, based on the statute of limitations. Now, Correct. that wouldn't make sense sense because and we haven't gotten to this yet i think in order to finish that part of the conversation um so let's uh, tell us or to tell me about so we, we, you're sort of 13 14 ish at this point yeah and at some point you leave that you leave the sea org you go back to australia so so sort of walk us through the uh, up to where we are 12 13 years old for sure through um, yes and then because you ended up on the rpf and you signed finally threw your hands up and said to heck with it and then you had to find mm -hmm. your way to literally nine thousand miles away from where you were Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So let's go back to, so I'm at the ranch. He comes and confesses. Now at this point in time, as I expressed earlier, like I did not have the ability to translate what happened to me into words. I, I couldn't speak about it. I didn't have the capability. Um, and what's interesting is now um, there's a time period that correlates with the witness what the two witnesses have brought forwards is that when I was eight years old, um, which would have been about the time that they were doing this handling, one of the handlings on my father for sexual battery, basically. Um, and um, they, um, well, at that time, they had also taken me in for counseling, although I didn't know anything about what it was about. Like they never told me and they ran this process on me. It's called um, grade zero quads, which is basically like, it's like, um, it's to raise a person's ability to communicate. And so I think that like, um, I think the questioning, like, I think it was a way of like fishing, like, is she able to talk about this? Does she, that's really what the process is. It's like, who would you be willing to talk about blah and like fill in the blank? Like, who would you be willing to talk about a table? Let's just, let's just say like, it wasn't, it wasn't sensitive things they were bringing up. They were, they were very mundane, like objects or whatever. Um, and so I think they were trying to see what my communication level was or to bring my communication level up to where I would talk about it. Um, but not informing me of anything of like the reason why I was doing it. Plus I hated it. I felt like I was being held against my will. And uh, I was eight. I absolutely was just like, I don't, I don't like this. I want this to end. Like, I don't know what this is about. Like I, it's not what I expected. Cause I had been told that auditing was like going to be amazing. And like, you know, I was going to, you know, all these incredible things were going to happen to me. And like, and I just didn't experience it at all. Was like, this is bullshit. Get me out of here. Like every day they would drag me back in and I didn't like it at all. I would hide in the bathroom and just stall and stall and stall. And, and, um, anyway, so eventually I think <laughs> they got me through that and it was incredibly uncomfortable. Um, and then when they didn't bring me back for more of that counseling, I was like, oh, thank goodness. And that was a huge relief to me. Um, and I, but I didn't talk about what had happened to me in that counseling session because I didn't even know what the, the purpose of it was really. And so, um, but yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't talk about it. And so 12, so by 12 years old, then he comes and then he says things that he did to me. And after that, um, 
Yeah, it wasn't until, so then I joined the Sierra at 13 years old and it wasn't until I was about 14 years old that, um, yeah, that's right. Okay. So he had at that time, um, then my mother had to divorce him because he wasn't qualified. So this is now 1998. And um, she was ordered by other staff member, like senior executives to divorce my father because he wasn't qualified to go to the international location. And so because of that, um, then she told us, she told my brothers and I, um, your father is not qualified to go to int level. And the reason he is not qualified is not important. Um, as in the thing that he did was not important. It's the fact that he didn't disclose it prior to his qualifications process. So it was just what they were, what they were upset about was the non-disclosure, not the acts themselves. And, um, because he didn't, he hadn't disclosed these prior acts back in Australia. That's what, as I understand it. And, um, but for me, as a 14-year-old child who was, uh, you know, obviously you can understand I was very impacted by my inability to um, understand and process emotion, um, you know, had experienced, you know, uh, yeah, <laughs> a lot of trauma by that stage. And my mother is sitting there saying to me that it's not important what he did. And I, I could only assume, I did not know, she didn't tell me, I could only assume that what she was referring to, or I could wonder about what she was referring to was what he had done to me. And so I just, at that point, I was just like, I was quite a mess. Like, and that's when I was locking myself in the bathroom um, for weeks at a time. I would, so we were supposed to be on course studying Scientology studies and I would um, leave and go and go to the bathroom and just cry. And then I would come out and I'd be all normal again. And then, you know, quote normal. And so that's what I, that's what I did. But eventually they found me doing that. And, um, then I got yelled at because, um, I, they then labeled me a potential trouble source. I was asked, you know, why was I crying? Like, why are you crying in the bathroom? And I was like, because I think I'm upset because my parents are getting divorced. Like I didn't, I wasn't even sure what I was so, like all I knew was the pain that I was experiencing. I just couldn't really, like I just, because there were so many unknowns. And so where do you start? And and then she was like, oh, she's like, well, you're a potential trouble source. Um, I was kind of a clumsy kid. So she said, because I like would stumble sometimes. Like, okay, so like you had to, for example, like when I was on the EPF, which is like the training camp prior to you being in the Sea Org, you have to run everywhere. And like, if we were running up the stairs, like I might like trip or something like that. Like I was a bit of a clumsy klutz. And, um, so she said, because like, yeah, it was a little bit like kind of physically awkward. So, um, so she said, yeah, that I was a potential trouble source. Uh, I think maybe I had been sick recently or something like that. And so for her, all of those things together, they were evidence to label me that label. Um, and what that means is that you're connected to a suppressive person is the other label. And so the suppressive person is a person who wants to do you harm and wants to damage you. And so I thought, okay, well, maybe that's going to help me. And so I was put into a counseling session again. It's not, this is not real counseling by any stretch of the imagination. This is experimental, you know, just really damaging processes. Um, well, and I, I can explain I more of that. Well, mm -hmm. I don't mean to interrupt. I think it's important that, that our viewers understand the yeah. people providing this counseling are not trained therapists. They're not LPCs, Correct. they're not psychologists, they're not psychiatrists. They are under edge statistically they are undereducated they're like you they didn't go to a traditional Correct. education they didn't finish high school in the in the in the conventional sense certainly don't mm -hmm. have any formal collegiate training there's no certifications there's no credentials there's no board memberships such as you know being part of the american psychology uh, psychiatric association or something these are sometimes even younger than you people who have received some arbitrary training that was originally made up by l ron hubbard and has been mm -hmm theory perfected as far as the ability to train massive mass numbers of people to conduct this this therapy these are the least qualified people to prov to be providing this and yet that's exactly what they're subjecting you to correct and then it's completely unregulated as well and so it's just like you know it's not licensed exactly like you said you know and david miscavige 
quite famously became an auditor when he was 11 years old and they used to stack the books up. He would have to sit on a stack of books so that he could be at the right height to face the person that he's delivering this counseling to. Um, David Miscavige, who is the leader of Scientology, he's never received a, you know, what we would consider a, um, a, a minimum level of education. And um, yeah. And so, yeah, you had children. And so when I was, placed into the C organization, that was my first role was to be training to be an auditor. So it was a bunch of us kids all in one group. And the youngest was 11 years old. And I think probably the oldest was 15 years old, um, just, you know, as my best guess. And um, there was a whole group of us, maybe like, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 kids. Um, and so... You know, maybe 30, let's say 30. And all of our purpose was to train to um, audit, provide this like nonsense counseling onto other people. Okay. But I, I was, I was really terrible at that. And that's, that's another thing is that I didn't really, Scientology and, and me did not, we didn't mesh very well. Like I didn't, it didn't, um, I couldn't really assimilate it like how other people, I saw the other kids advancing further than me and I was kind of being left behind. No, it wasn't the, the last sort of, there was another group of girls who um, they were suffering because the other thing that can happen is you can get really messed up in your own head when you're studying and you're using the Hubbard study technology. So there was a group of girls who um, they termed it going significant, which means that you basically, you just go a bit like loopy in your head and you hyper-focus on words because the Hubbard technology is never go past a word that you do not understand. So if, um, I said, a, you know, the, so for example, we would have these like group meetings, which they called musters. And if, uh, they would tell the person who was talking to us to like pause mid sentence and say, I don't know what the definition of the word two is as in T like T O. I don't know what the definition of two is that you used in that sentence. And we'd have to stop the whole muster. Like it was, I was like, I, I think I'm going crazy. You know, when like someone else's like mental illness is like spilling over into your own. It's like, I, I like, yeah. So all of this as well was going on at the exact same time. We were trying to like, you know, shove in this Hubbard study technology, which is, which can actually have severe psychological impacts. And, and as I said, a small portion of the girls that were in this group were suffering from those in a very real and open way. Whereas I was like suffering privately and trying not to have my suffering noticed, but it was noticed. Okay. So then, so then at that time, so I get labeled a potential trouble source and I get placed into this, as I said, this like whatever we want to call it. I'm going to just term it counseling. It's not real counseling as we've described. And so um, the person who's doing it on me, part of the process is to locate the person who is suppressing you. And I said, okay, well, I think it's my father. And he said, well, hang on, your father is a Sea Org member. Like he can't be a suppressive person. You need to go and pick something else. The thing is that they won't let you out of that room until you have reached the what's called the end phenomena. So you have to get that floating needle because you're on this e-meter thing. And so you have to get that end result or else they will not let you leave. And so I was like, OK, so I have to find something else. And I was like, I'm like, I can't find anything. And he's like, look again, look again. He's like, there, there. What's that? You know, identifying a reaction on this meter that I'm connected to. Um, and so I'm like, OK, well, I see, you know, this image of blah and I describe it. And he's like, oh, yes, that's it. You know, and suddenly I'm like in this like past life incident, uh, which is like, I mean, that's a bit dubious. I mean, everyone can make up their own mind about that. But really what I felt like I was being directed to, um, you know, just imagine, use my imagination to describe something. And then because you're describing it in such detail, you're really creating this false memory because now things are textured and like, you know, it's colorful and it's very visible Like because you're describing what you're seeing. And, and so you're developing it as well as, as you go. So, so that didn't work. I come out of there and then I'm even, I'm in a way worse state. Like I'm just crying all the time. I'm just an absolute mess. Now, and so then they laid. I don't want to interrupt, but in, so so in response to that, there was something you said that that I found incredibly powerful. 
you described the the therapy that you went through the the counseling that you went through as they were doing this to me correct in a traditional certified tradi you know um conventional therapeutic counseling session it's my therapist and i are doing this together as part of this journey of healing mm -hmm. and i think mm -hmm. the word the way that you use the word to exactly identifies what it is it's we're going to Correct. do this to check the box and then we're going to manipulate your story till it fits within a narrative we can accept and then we're going to say mm -hmm. it's your fault you're here try it again mm -hmm. Correct. That's such a good point that you raised. So the language around that is like, I would say, oh, I'm going to receive this process. Or someone would say to you, oh, that, um, so maybe the auditor will say, I'm going to deliver this to you. I'm going to deliver this process to you. So that is the language. It isn't a um, working together to figure it out. It's the auditor knows that's how that's what you believe the auditor knows what they're doing they're guided by the e-meter but hubbard they are familiar with hubbard's you know technology on that particular topic and then they know how to um run that process the it's based it's hubbard basically trans you know like transmitting the process through the the auditor what's called the auditor and the auditor cannot vary he cannot verge from that process so even the auditor isn't even really working with you so if you can understand that it's really is being just hubbard's words being inserted into you and it's like yeah that well, the insertion working, process the auditor is working on half on behalf of scientology Correct. They are there to protect yeah. Scientology's interest in Scientology's uh, outcome. There's that as well. Which, which is the role There's the auditor that. serves. Correct. So that was, I guess, my first attempt to say, hey, there's a bad guy. Bad guy's do, done this to me and, and I'm suffering because of it. Now, because they because it was dismissed like, oh, no, it can't be him. Then I just I just bought him out into this state which we we would probably refer to as depression uh, i had no idea what that was but they labeled me what's called a sad effect and that's actually not something that's commonly used i hadn't heard of it what before when they had labeled it to me but um but basically um yeah a sad effect hubbard describes so obviously this again is another phenomenon that is a side effect of the thing the processes and the things that happen but the side effect is basically when a person is kind of like permanently upset they are always sad they're they're experiencing grief grief on a constant basis and it's a state really it's a state of depression um and so they then they put this label on my folder because all of your records things that you're talking about are kept in these folders and then they um and then I had to go into for another session for someone who was more highly qualified, highly trained. And so he asked me set a set a few questions. He said, um, do you have an ARC break? And the meter read on that. And I started crying. And if ARC is affinity, reality, and communication, and it's the basis, uh, Hubbard says, it's the basis of understanding. So it's kind of like the basis of your connection with people in the world around you, I guess. Like, so if you have good ARC for something like your have, a, you have a good relationship with it. Uh, and so, yeah, do you have an ARC break? And I was like, yes. And I was crying. And he said, was it a, a break in affinity reality? And then that's where it read on reality. And then, um, yeah. And so, uh, he, um, yeah. So, so, so then he was like, okay, so is it a break in reality? And I, I was like, yes, it's a break in reality. And so that means that, well, I mean, I think that kind of explains itself. And then, um, and so he was like, tell me about that. And so then, uh, I was like, I can't tell you, of course I knew what I wanted to tell him that this had been happening to me, but I'd never said the words out loud. And so we were in that room for quite a while where he was trying to get that get me to talk about it and finally he was like okay well would it help if you wrote it down and um and i think i think that other people who were children when they experienced this type of trauma probably could relate to this it's like this like this 
I don't know, there's a wall there. Like you can't, it's like trying to get the thing out of you and then, and then say it. Like when you have so much that's, you know, maybe it's shame, whatever. I don't know what it is, but it's like, I couldn't say the words. And so, um, I, I said, okay, maybe it'll help if I write it down. So he tore off a piece of paper and I wrote down, um, now, I don't know exactly where I got this word from, but I do know that I was a real avid reader as a kid. And that was the one thing that they didn't restrict. Like they didn't restrict reading books because literacy would be really helpful for you to be a Sea Org member. And they did restrict um, music and they restricted sugar, for example, and they restricted access to like news. And like there were so many things that were restricted, but reading books was not monitored or restricted. And so I was reading books at a very young age, um, you know, that were, you know, thick novels that um, were probably about topics that, you know, maybe 11 year old wouldn't normally be reading. I'm not sure. But, um, but I understood this term molest. And so that's what I wrote down. Now I wouldn't call it that. That's not the word I would use now. Like, as I understand more about it, it's sexual battery and it was an incredibly violent act. Um, and so it, it was, I just think that molest is not specific enough. It does not describe what I had experienced, but it was the word that I knew through reading books like I was reading VC Andrews and I don't know what age group that's appropriate for but I remember reading VC Andrews when I was like maybe like nine years old and I know that some of the topics in there is like on that subject anyways so I write down the piece of paper and I say um my dad molested me and he read it and he said, okay. And he put it in my folder and, or he put it to the side. And then I was holding the cans and of course I'm crying and I'm, I'm having relief from saying it out loud. And then he says, your needles floated. And I, I'm like, okay. And then that's it. That's end of session. That's the end of it. And then that was it. No one ever brought it up to me. I kept expecting someone to be like, oh, okay. So pull you aside like you know you you mentioned this and like we just wanted to help you with it nothing that was it, it was just done over yep. yeah so then that was for a number of years and then it wasn't until oh okay so following on from that then I tell a friend I tell a close friend which is Sina who I appeared in the show with yeah then later I tell a boyfriend and then later in my later my late teens as I'm becoming more rebellious inside the C organization and I'm saying I want to leave and then I make a huge stand or I do a huge action so we can get to that but what was if you wanted to ask any questions so I, I mean we're just we're, we're progressing through your your short but horrendous and horrific and awful career as a C org member at mm -hmm. some point I know you end up and sort of I think that the thing that became the catalyst to get you to the point where you were ready to walk away was when you end up assigned to the RPF, I think in your late teens, like 17. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's, it's your story to tell. You can tell whatever detail you want to. You told me before we, you know, when, when we met before how you ended up there. And I thought, I just sort of, I almost laughed at the comical hypocrisy of the entire yes. situation of, of how mm -hmm. we, of how you ended up there and, and, and sort of reached the point where you said, you know what, to hell with this, I'm out. Right. Mm -hmm. the, the joke, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make like a fat kid in dodgeball and out. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I just we, totally. we, sort of the, the, the whole scenario around you end up in the RPF because of certain actions you you decide to engage in, which mm -hmm. any other scenario would be perfectly lawful. Totally. But, right. But, but, yes. But you, you report things that have no adverse outcome to anybody but you. You become mm -hmm. you become the victim of the perpetrator and of the organization. You are victimized multiple times. And yet you end up on the mm -hmm. earth. Absolutely. Yes. And um, just because you remind me, I want to just emphasize as well that when um, you see going back, and I, I've only learned this recently, that the fact that they learned of an incident of abuse, then they, you know, quote, did their Scientology on him. And then they, and then he um, committed the assault 
again. And so that there is a huge responsibility by the organization. He was employed by them and I was in their care where they did not, they did not report it. They've never reported it to the police and that they allowed him to continue to perpetrate the harm against me. And then, um, yeah. So then just like for years, not, really addressing it with me in any real way um and me not knowing what they knew really like it was just very confusing so those years when like between when I'm like 14 years old to 17 years old where the organization I know I become a you know of course by then now I know the I, by 12 I knew that the organization knew I didn't, just didn't know how much and it's just like from 12 like so then yeah from 12 years old onwards is when more and more I understand that the organization knows and um but that was a very slow process and I um and like who who knew and what did they know like I didn't know I didn't know the extent of it and I know a lot more now okay so um, initially when I'm in the C organization, which, um, yeah, so I, I, I'm very, once I joined the C organization, see, I, as I said, I was like a bit of a rebellious kid, but once I was in the C organization, there's really real co consequences if you do something wrong. And that consequence is, is like the room 101 in, um, in 1984 George Orwell it's like the worst thing that you can imagine and that is the RPF the rehabilitation project force so once I joined in working for them um and I'd been punished as a um as a kid I think I was 12 13 years old when I was put on something that was like the kids RPF basically it was like a RPF for children and so I had some taste of what that was like but in the C organization it's way 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 worse because there was a kid on there that I knew when he was a teenager and he was in there at that time until he was in his 20s um and so he had spent like on this RPF he had spent like a good a good portion of his life I think he'd been in there for like eight years or something um and that was common. And there was like at that time in Los Angeles, there was usually about 200 of these people on the RPF. And so I had seen it in like it sort of changed over the years, but originally you would have to wear all black and then it changed like you would have to wear a gray T-shirt and black pants or whatever. But it's always like a way of distinguishing you as your piece of shit compared to the rest of the group. Um, and you get, you stay there until they say it's okay for you to leave that lower um, positioning. Um, you have to seek approval. And that's only after you do many, many, many of their processes, which, and the reconditioning and all that, and the reprogramming that goes on, um, then you can seek approval to get out of that. But you cannot leave until they say it's okay. And you have to run everywhere. Um, you're doing you're doing the the hardest labor jobs that are uh, on in that location on that base and um, and yet you're getting now I, I believe the RPF pay was I think about $15 a week um, maybe I that, that's as best as I can sort of recall it uh, at that location in Los Angeles and um and anyways they're just treated as the worst they're not allowed to talk to people they're not like they're not they're not regular people. They don't have the rights. If if there was any rights at all in the C organization, which of which there was like minimal anyways, um, certainly people on the RPF are designated. They're like designated like non-people, like non-humans basically. And um, yeah, they're just in the worst conditions. Uh, so that was a horror for me. And I was like, and I had grown up with seeing people on the RPF since I was a little kid. And I knew what that looked like. And I, as, as I said, I'd seen this one guy who I'd basically watched him grow up and become a man from a child to a man on the RPF. So it was, it was very familiar to me that this was some kind of horror that I never wanted to be in. And, um, and that was being held over everyone's head. So if you do, if you break the rules, you're going to go to the RPF. Right. And so I was like, so when I'm in the C organization, I'm like, I'm trying to be the best C org member I can. And I'm probably not doing a great job of it, but I'm really trying my best because I'm terrified. And um, I have my first boyfriend, like, for while I'm in the C org, my first like C org boyfriend. And um, 
and I'm like so scared. <laughs> like, again, it's just like, it's crazy. But then I meet this guy who was really, really cool. And he, he just had a freedom with his emotion. Okay. So that first Sea Org boyfriend that I wanted to mention, he was from the Int Ranch, which was even worse in terms of emotion repression uh, was even worse. So like the two of us, like being together, it was just like, I, we, I think we broke up. He broke up with me like after two weeks, like we could barely even maintain a conversation. Um, it was super, super awkward. Then I meet this guy who had grown up in Scientology. He had been in the CR before, but he was like a bit, you know, a bit of a rebel and he kind of just would say whatever he felt. And he was so free with his emotion that I, um, yeah, it just blew me away. And I fell madly in love with him. And it was a very like intense relationship. And, um, anyways, that's, he ends up, being put on the RPF, he ends up being declared a suppressive person. Um, actually, prior to that, so while he's on the RPF, then I'm I'm like, he's based. When you go to the RPF, you're like you've gone to no man's land. No idea when you're going to come out of there. It could be years. I had promised him that I would like wait for him because we were very like had these romantic ideas. But it's like, how long do you wait? It's uh, kind of crazy. Yeah. So anyways, I know I'm like kind of sidetracking in my storytelling, but, um, but yeah, so I, I, by 15 years old, I was like, um, you know, I had started to be, I was beginning to be like, okay, I don't think I want to be here, but like, how do I do that? And then progressively from 15 to 17 years old, um, then I was getting into trouble. And um, so at one stage, sorry, just to track back to him, he was, he left the RPF and then he, um, and then he got declared as oppressive person, which means that he no longer exists. And that was really devastating for me. So my, my world was really rapidly changing. Like I can't love the person that I love. I can't, I can't, I don't want to be here, but I have to be here. I have no way out. And all of these things are kind of coming to the surface. And then I start rebelling and I end up, um, I actually, once I escaped and LAPD, um, arrested me, <laughs> and then do you want to know that story? Cause I feel like I'm just like rambling at this point. I know we're getting to where the RPF, where I go on the RPF, but like, there's kind of some detail before. Well, it, it, I mean, yeah. it, 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 it's your story. We've got, you know, um, 630 some people watching this right now. And so it's, oh, thanks, I, I'm not, I'm not, uh, uh, the, the lawyer in me says I want to drive the examination as we say but I'm not going to it's your story if you want to share it you can share it if you it doesn't have to be linear or chronological it certainly doesn't have to be reasonable because there's nothing reasonable about your story because there's nothing reasonable about the world you were born into yeah. um, and I'm just I'm just sort of sitting here observing and learning with with the rest of the folks and it's it's sort of on mm -hmm. uh, it's it's sort of up to you on how you want to guide the discussion that's one of the frustrations I hear from people a lot who've told their story in a highly structured environment is I was either told the order I was going to tell my story or I told my story and then the editors did exactly what their job is to do. And they took my two hour mm. story and they put it in a 42 minute box in a chronological order because it's easy for viewers to follow. Yeah. And yeah. so it's up to you to tell the story the way you want to tell it. So I'm not going to answer your question. Yes or no. It's up to you to tell your story. However <laughs> you want to tell it. I so appreciate that, Zach. It's lovely. Okay. So yeah. Um, so I guess, you know, because it's hard because you want to, you want to layer in context along the way. And I, I feel like I haven't even given enough context in terms of what were the, the sort of the mechanisms there, but I think I have done a good job in, in, t in talking about some of them, some of the more prominent ones. So I just wanted to say that. Well, and sure, so, I, I just do in the chat because I had a question yeah. that was asked to me by one of my moderators either later tonight or, or, or tomorrow, I will do a live Q and a with anybody who wants to ask follow-up questions, um, ab about my thoughts on it. And then I will keep a list of questions for you. And we can always do videos oh, in the cool. future where we sort of dial in some of these specific topics. And if you sort of tell the 10,000 foot version today or however you want to tell it. And then if there's people who have specific questions, I feel like we have a lot of under the radar Scientologists hanging out with us right now. Um, mm -hmm. and I think that's I worth hope so maybe some of these questions are coming from some of those folks looking for different avenues of exit and things. Uh, and so, mm. you know, we'll, we can tell your story today. And then if we have, and if I get enough questions about a specific subject area, I'm more than happy to invite you back and you and I can address some of these more nuanced topics as, because people are always going to have more questions after we're done than they have while we're here. 
Mm, that's that's awesome. Yeah, it's amazing. All right, cool. So so okay. So I'm I'm starting to be like, yeah, I'm starting to like kind of <laughs> enter my rage era, my early, you know, my my early rage era, which is um. And by the way, at the time, I was listening to a lot of uh, K Rock as well, and um, yeah. So I was like, I was just like a like you know, was just like that that rebellion that that angst that like I don't want to be here like um and can I say this can I say an f word uh we're far enough into the video and I actually did not monetize this video so you can say whatever you want to <laughs> okay you know that rage against the machine song um killing in the name and it's like fuck you I won't do what or what is it fuck you I won't do what they told you or something uh, fuck you I won't do what you told me or whatever I don't know um, anyways, that was like, that was like my anthem because it was just like, yeah, just that rebellion and, um, yeah. And just uh, like, just get me out of here. I don't want to do this. I wanted to, um, you know, I wanted to do art and I wanted to do writing and, um, and, and it was just incredibly frustrating. I wasn't supposed to be there. And I, I knew that. And also even like, this it still felt like a foreign land to me. I didn't understand anything about this country. I wanted to go back home. I wanted to go back to Australia. I wanted to go back to before all the hell happened, you know. And um, and it, the, the the question was though was like, how do I do that? How do I get there? I have no money, and I don't have my passport had had expired, so I don't have a current passport. I can't afford a plane ticket. I don't have anywhere to go to in the U S I don't have any family to go to. And so, um, there was a lot that I had to try and figure out. And so one of the things that happened was that I was like, okay, okay. So I'd, I'd gone and told the staff member that you're supposed to tell the person that's in the ethics section. And I said, I don't want to be here. I want to leave. And I was 15 at that time. And, um, she, she said, um, okay, well, that's fine. Well, then you can't be in the position that you're in right now. And because I was in the marketing department and so they busted me to a cleaner. And so then I real, and then it's like months went by and I'm just like cleaning the building. That's my job. And it's like, it's, it was so boring. And I, I was just like, it was like, yeah, it was super boring. Um, them and you know in the meantime I'm not getting an education so I'm being deprived of anything that would be kind of stimulating you know a young brain needs some stimulation and um we had this like cleaning closet basically was like the cleaner's office and it was just it was just me in there for hours there was two shifts there was me and another girl and then she would come in and would swap shifts and it was just like I felt like I was like dying. I was like, I cannot do this. This is, they're just going to keep me here. They're going to keep me doing this forever. I've told them they want I, that I want to leave and they haven't done anything about it. I, I should like, this is anyways. So I was like, okay, I need to do something big now. I need to go and do something where it's really going to get their attention that they have to actually help me to leave. So I like planned this escape. And the thing is like with the, an escape, it was not an escape forever. It was like an escape. And then I'm going to come back because I have to come back because I have nowhere to go in the outside world. The, the escape part of it was just to let them know like, Hey, Miriam is a risk here and you need to address, like you need to do what's happening. You know, you need to deal with what's happening and that she needs to leave. Okay. So I escaped in the night. Um, and I, I left the base and anyways, I went somewhere. And then when I realized I wanted to turn around and go back, the, um, the Metro had stopped and I didn't realize that there was like, I mean, cause I just didn't know a whole lot. I assumed that they just kept running all night, but it was midnight and it had stopped. And I was like, okay, I can't go back where I came from. So I was like, okay, I guess I'm just gonna like sleep the night out here. And there was a concrete bench and it was starting to get cold. And I lay down on the concrete bench and I just like, it was so, I couldn't get any comfort. Now I was getting cold. And I thought, okay, well, at that time I tried, there was a pay phone. So I tried to call my mother and then it just went to like the switchboard operator. Cause they, you know, obviously they're closed. And, um, so, and cause I had memorized her number by heart cause she had the same phone number like for forever, for many years. And, um, and so then I started walking and walking and walking. And then I, I found a, a 7-Eleven eventually. Um, 
And I was like, oh, I'll just go in here and get a snack. <laughs> and I went in there and then this woman saw me and she was like, you know, obviously, um, yeah, I think by this stage, yeah, again, I can't tell you my exact age. I think it was like 15, 16 by this stage. Yeah, because as I recall, okay, yes, because I've been on this cleaner position for ages, right, as I said. So now by this stage, I'm 16, but I look like a very young, I look very, very young. I don't look, you know, I've been inside indoors most of my life by that stage or the like the last, you know, few years. I've been spent my time indoors, so I'm quite pale and I'm very, very naive. Um, and I just, yeah. Um, and so she spots me straight away and she was like, tells the clerk, like, you need to call the police. And and so the police came and yeah, they just came in there with full force. And then the woman was, the police officer was asking me questions. But of course, um, and my instinct of first was to lie to um, protect the church. So at first I like tried to make a story and then she was like, that's bullshit. And I was like, okay, I'll tell you the truth. And I was crying. And then um, when I start telling her the truth, the truth sounds crazier than the lie. It sounds way less believable because she's like, where is your mother? And I'm like, well, she's at a confidential location. I don't have her address. They don't like, they're not going to understand. that. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So then I was, um, handcuffed and brought back to the police station. I was kept there for some hours in handcuffs the whole entire time. They never took the handcuffs off me until it was about four, I think four in the morning when they dropped me off outside this um, like foster home, they had described it as a soda home, which was a um, like a temporary overnight foster home, they explained to me, and they uncuffed me on the front lawn um, outside that house before they sent me inside. So prior to that, they had me in like this holding cell, and they um, would just come in and repeatedly ask me the same questions over and over and over, and it went on for hours. And um, before that, when I had arrived at the station, the police officers were like just joking and jeering and like making fun of me as well. So um, and I'm crying and like it was just an awful experience, you know, being handcuffed for hours and in, in a cell and um, treated like a criminal when I, I wasn't a criminal at all, obviously. And so they couldn't figure out what to do with me. So they took me to that place. Yeah. Um, and then, and then someone from Scientology, a representative from Scientology came and got me at about two o'clock in the afternoon the next day. And, uh, yeah, I had been, <laughs> cause I woke up and I saw there was a TV right next to me. So when I arrive at like four o'clock in the morning, I just crash out straight. Like I get shown to a room. I just lay on the bed. I fall asleep. I'm probably fully clothed the whole lot, just like pass out. And then in the, and then I wake up maybe like, let's say like 10 o'clock in the morning and I notice this TV right next to me and I turn it on and I basically just for hours watch Judge Judy. <laughs> we weren't allowed to watch TV ever. So it was like the best thing to me. I just was like, I just thought it was amazing. Um, yeah. And then they took me back and then I was like, okay, cool. So now they're going to take it seriously that I want to leave. But then that process again, just went on and on and on. And they, um, yeah. And then eventually to the RPF story. So I'll tell you the, um, the significant thing that happened then was September 11th happened. And, um, at that time, so my father, because he was, if we go back when he wasn't qualified to go up to international level, what they did was they sent him, they ha kept him in the same position, which was still a good position. It was still a good role. He was a representative for, um, for int basically for golden air productions. And, um, they kept him in that role and they just, they just transferred him to a different location. Um, in other words, they took him outside of the jurisdiction of the crime that had occurred which I more recently found out was common practice. And it, it's referred to as the OSA drill. Of course, as a kid, I didn't know what the hell was going on. So they had moved him in 1998 to um, the UK, to the St. Hill location, East Grinstead, Sussex, um, the castle. That's where he worked. 
Okay, so by this stage, now it's 2001 and September 11th happens and leading up to that. So now I'm, I'm because, you know, I've escaped, I've been brought back. Now I'm put on this thing called the DEX, which is like this. Basically, it's like you're doing, you're doing labor, um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, but you're also doing this ethics programming and you're also trying to like leave. So you're doing this certain process to get out basically. But then that was just sort of dragging on and on and on again. Like I, they didn't want me to leave. So whatever they could do, they were just trying to keep me. And um, September 11th happens and it's, it's chaos. Um, I don't understand enough about the outside world to understand anything about this. And I don't think anyone at that time, like if you remember thinking back to, September 11th, like, do you remember what that was like for you for your experience of it? And how did it feel for you? Yeah, I was in, <clears throat> excuse me, I was in uh, junior high school at the time. Yeah. And I can remember sort of a buzz even going because we're in central time. And so by the time I got to school that morning, the events had started to unfold on the East Coast. And I can remember just sort of this weird buzz in the air. Like the teachers all sort of looked frenetic and teachers tend to look frenetic anyway, but they looked even more frenetic than the normal and then uh, the teachers, everybody was leaving to go get gas and, the, you know, the whole thing. So they had mm. they had hundreds of us crammed into a large space watching television. And then my mom came and picked me up. I'm from a small town. I graduated with 77 students. There's 2,000 people in my hometown, little bitty, teeny, tiny, middle of nowhere, flyover mm. place. My mom came and checked me out, took me home. And she, she said, you need to see this. It's going to make you uncomfortable. Um, but this is history. You need to see this. This is to your generation what JFK was to my generation so you need to experience oh. it so but 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 i i can remember seeing the people that on tv who are normally calm and sort of reading you the news or they have this panicked look in their face and weird uh intervals for commercial breaks and you can hear the you can hear the production staff in the background sort of yelling and screaming as they're trying to bring in information and so i can appreciate sort of the frenetic and the the world sort of out of control chaos that was happening mm -hmm. um even more so than normal in your world because of this outside influence that you don't normally have Right. And then I also wanted to point out too, is like, we didn't have access to TV. Right. And I'll tell you how I experienced it was, um, I was asleep in my bunk and it was like midday. What would happen is I would work during the night, like you do an all nighter and then you'd sleep in the day. So I'm just in my bunk and, um, Andrea, who was, who lived in the room next door to me, she runs in and she's like, and I don't actually don't even know how she had found the radio. She could have found out from the radio because we did have radio playing. Right. But of course I didn't have radio going on. It was quiet in my room. She runs in and she is just like hair everywhere. She's frantic. She's waving photos around. She's just like saying things. I don't understand what she's saying. And I'm, I'm just like, Andrea, just stop, <laughs> sit down. Like tell, tell me what the fuck you're trying to say. And she was like, know my family and she had photos of her family and the photos were of her family that lived in New York and so you could see the buildings behind it was a photo from Central Park you see the, the towers behind and then it's like a basically it was like a family portrait type of thing her family's there and um and she's like I don't know what happened to my family and I don't know if they're alive or dead and like she was freaked out and I'm like okay well you know just trying to calm her down and I'm going like what the hell is going on I don't understand and finally she explained that the you know, what had happened to the towers. And, and then, um, I, and then I think it was like the next day or something, I spotted a newspaper, um, which didn't often come inside the building, but every once in a while, so you'd get a, a newspaper in and I spotted a newspaper in the dining room and that had photos of it. And then on the radio as well, I'm hearing, um, uh, that, um, you know, everywhere they were trying to like figure out where was the next target because there was a number of places that had been hit. And so one of the things that was being said is that like it might be Los Angeles next. And um, anyway, so my father calls me at that time and he said, um, you know, like it's not a good idea for you to leave the Sea Org and go and live in, and like be out in the world in the U.S., in this chaos. And also he said that um, Los Angeles was a potential target and he repeated that. And 
he was like, you don't know what's going to happen. And so um, you should come here. And I was like, well, why would I go there as in to England to work with him? He wanted to give me a job working next to him. And I was like, that's not, doesn't sound like a good idea. And um, I was like, I'm leaving the Sea Org. I don't want to go. And he basically convinced me. He was very adamant. And he was like, well, why don't you give the Sea Org a second chance? And I had all these thoughts going on, like, is, is it even going to be a be comfortable around him? Like it might not, but I hadn't been around him much for a number of years. So, um, and he kept saying like, give it a chance. And if you don't like it, you can leave, you can leave whenever you want. And if you don't, da, 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 da. And so he kept saying these things that I was like, you know, whatever reason that I had to not go, he would sort of address that and, you know, give me a, a reason to do it. And then I thought as well, I'm like, okay, well, right now where I'm at, it's impossible for me to get my passport renewed. I don't have the money, but if I do this, they will give me, they will renew my passport for me. And that means if I don't like it when I get to England and I say I want to leave, they, they are most likely going to send me to Australia. And that was the goal. I wanted to go to Australia. So I thought, okay, yes, there's risk here, but if I don't like it, I can leave and I can get to the place that I want to go to. I don't want to be in the US, especially not right now when it's crazy. And I also have nowhere stable to go to. Um, so yeah, so then I end up going to England. And what I learned later, this is actually in um, in evidence, this is police evidence, it's a recorded phone call between myself and my father, which took place um, in March, late March 2023, last year. And what he explained of that situation was that he was ordered by his senior official to, this is like, as near a quote as I can give, he said, get Miriam here and make sure she likes it. So what had happened just prior to that is that I wrote a letter to David Miscavige at RTC. So this is in Los Angeles. This is after the whole police LAPD incident, right? LAPD brings me back. And by the way, um, and so I should say as well, because I'm jumping around a bit here, is that we were taught that um, that outside authorities were evil, government is evil. That was ingrained in me since childhood. And that was all I knew. Like the outside world is chaotic and evil. And then I see like these big things happen, like September 11th. I'm like, oh, well, maybe it is crazy out there. Like, you know what I mean? And it was just confirming all those things. And then my my interaction with LAPD, where they, uh, you know, they arrested me on the spot, like handcuffed me on the spot, detained me, they ridiculed me, they laughed at me, they poked fun at me while I was crying and in handcuffs. And like, it's just like the, the um, how degrading that experience was. And, the, you know, just like, I was just like, well, yeah, of course, why would you go? to the police. Um, it all made sense to me, everything that Hubbard had said, right? And so, um, okay, so then, it, so then, so then, but this, like, sorry, back, back before I go to England, right, just back up just a little bit, I'm 16 years old, and I'm on this thing called the Dex, and I'm trying to do this routing out thing, and I just thought, well, uh, oh, at that time, my mother has a conversation with me and I realized that she actually she has a conversation with my legal guardian. I, I realized that she and my legal guardian. No, they gave me a legal guardian because I had escaped. And so anyway, sorry, I'm jumping around here quite a lot. But um, they gave me a legal, legal guardian. They assigned me one after I had escaped and been brought back. And then my mother says something to her, which then makes me realize like, oh, all these motherfuckers know like all these people know how, like how many more people know, like, it was just crazy to me. So then I sat my mother down and I said, look, um, something needs to be done about this. Like, how come there's been no consequences for him? Like at the very least, like, I, I understand we can't report it to outside authorities, but at the very least, shouldn't he be on the RPF? Like the RPF, this thing that's been like held over my head my whole life, like that I've been terrified of, like, shouldn't he get that punishment? Cause that's where you go when you do the bad things. And she was like, yeah, I, I never understood why nobody, you know, nothing was ever done to him for it. Um, and then, so I was like, well, what can we do? And she, she suggested like, oh, maybe you can write to David Miscavige, like write to the leader. And then 
see yeah so i write this letter and i say in there there's been no consequences for what my father has done to me and that he should be placed on the rpf now i'm not thinking about it from the way they're thinking about it they're thinking about it like hang on this girl's just ended up at lapd we brought her back but now she's talking about like consequences for her father and we know that the incidents the crime occurred in los angeles so that means that she could go to LAPD again, and she could report the crime, and they would have to. Um, now, I didn't know that they knew about the Los Angeles crime. Like, I'm just trying to like phrase this in a way. Like, there's so much that I didn't know at that time, but now I know what they knew. And so, um, so okay, okay, so of course, what they do. So then, my father gets this order from his senior, saying, and the senior gets her orders from the international level, saying that you need to get Miriam out here, and you need to make sure she likes being here. Now, that part, make sure she likes being here, because they needed to keep me for a certain period of time, because they're trying to wait out the statute of limitations. So, if you understand how calculated that is, of course, I have no idea. I'm just thinking, okay, maybe that's going to get me closer to my out. So I, I arrive there and I work with him. It's incredibly uncomfortable. I start having like, you know, psychological impacts start spiraling. Um, and I'm like, I'm basically in this like trauma state. I'm separated, you know, from you know, dissociating constantly. And I do end up in a relationship at that time um, with this super sweet guy that had just kind of arrived um, into the Sea Org. And his name was Matt. And he was like funny and sweet and all that. And like, bear in mind, I still had this, like, I'm in love with this other person who's been like torn from me that that is no longer is allowed to exist because he's a suppressive person. This is the other relationship that I had. So I didn't, I wasn't like, I wasn't super emotionally connected to this person, but it became like this escape from reality. It was like the reprieve, like when we had, you know, we could take time to have a hang out or have a private conversation or whatever, you know, um, there was relief in that having a relationship, if that makes sense. Um, but other, other than that, I was feeling pretty lost. I was doing really well on my job and, um, I was getting like, you know, commended for that and recognized for, producing really well, but I could no longer study Scientology um, because of whatever went on with the study technology and just the not assimilating the Scientology words and Hubbard's words. By that stage, I'm, I have allocated amount of time to do course each day. And I sit in front of the course pack, which is the materials, like the policies that I'm supposed to read. And I, I, I'm just immediately, I'm falling asleep. I can't even read, like, I cannot read what it says. It's just like, so I'm just trying to explain like there was some really crazy full on, you know, psychological stuff that was going on at the time. And, and meanwhile, there's this perpetrator who there's been no consequences for him. And um, I realized even my, like my senior official, this person who had given him the order, which I didn't know about, she, she said to me after I'd been there for a couple of weeks, she was like, um, oh, so like, you know, if you want to talk about what happened with your dad, like, it's just was like so casual, like, oh, you ever want to have a chit chat? And I was like, what the fuck is going on? Like, all these people know, and they're just acting like it's all okay. And like, oh, yeah, like, do, 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 do. like I don't know. It was just like, I just was. I was, it was clear to me that there was no consequences for him and no one cared about it and no one was interested in there being consequences and it, that was very well known. And again, back to this recorded phone call, this pretext call um, with the perpetrator, he, he says, he uses those words himself. He says it was very well known. He said it was so well known. Um, and so, okay. So yeah. So, so anyways, eventually I ended up, um, engaging in an intimate, intimate experience with my boyfriend, um, where I lost my virginity. Basically I had, I had consensual sex with my boyfriend and, um, yeah, and that's a whole story, but, um, but it wasn't really like, I don't know, like, I, I just, yeah. And then, uh, anyways, so they put me on the meter and they, um, they said, did you, did you do this? And I said, yes, I did. And so they kicked him out immediately. 
and this guy, Matt, his name was, and, um, and I was placed on the RPF and I was like, this is crazy. Like that I'm here. And yeah, it just was wild. So sorry. Do you have any questions at this point before I keep going? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, what, what, what you're telling me sort of makes, makes sense. Um, at least, you know, chronologically. And then at some point you end up, well, you end up on the RPF and that from what you've told me before sort of was the event that you said, you know, come hell or high water, I'm, I'm out of here. We, we got to find a way right. to get out of here. And so I think, I mean, we're, we're coming up on, on two hours. And so I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, we can probably, uh, in today sort of on your journey out and how you ended up out and back in Australia and how you ultimately left Scientology altogether, not just as a Sea Org member, but even as public Scientology sort of walked away and left that as a significant, mm -hmm. but, uh, a prior part of your life. And then in, in a, in a follow-up video, we can do what your, what your journey, your healing journey has looked like where you are today, the, yeah. the various uh, interfaces and contacts you've had with a variety of criminal justice systems, both in mm -hmm. Australia and the United States. Um, mm -hmm. so the, the, the civil litigation impact, um, because I think we've got a lot of sort of been watching the chat as we go. And there are a lot of people who are um, connected emotionally to your story. And so I think okay. uh, in order to bring this full circle at some point in the future, a week, 10 days, whatever, we'll find a time. Um, we'll sort of do this as we'll do the follow on as part two, you know, here was my story in and how I got out. And then this mm -hmm. is the path that it's taken. How, here's where I am in my recovery today. Here's how, what I went through to get here. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that I think uh, in order to sort of break this down into um, digestible chunks, I mean, there's a lot of people who it's going to take several days to process everything you've just conveyed to them. Because that's fair. That's if, fair. If, if I take this video and I break it down, any 10 minute block is a lifetime of trauma to any one person. But you have two hours of 10 minute blocks of trauma. Right. So that's from fair. a practical perspective in order to digest this and fully comprehend yeah. What you've been through, I think, is going to take. It's going to take me several days to process it completely, and and I was prepared for this. There are a lot of people who are not prepared for this. I think it's going to take them some time to process it as well. Mm -hmm. And then I guess also, like, if they have any questions too, um, then when we come back, so yeah, so if we leave it up there, and then because really, so at this kind of um, when I'm on the RPF and and see, I would like to go into detail of what that experience was like, me actually being in that. So yeah, it's a it's a great idea to leave it at this um, and then go from there because then really we get into um, then how this transitions into a criminal case um, and and from there, yeah, and then the results of that. And then also I want to say that um, I do have some treatment. Um, the beautiful people of SPTV, um, yourself included, uh, were amazing in raising funds for me to get a particular post-traumatic stress treatment. And that is taking place for me very soon. And I, because I kind of want to be private about that experience. I don't want to like say when that publicly when that is. I just want to be able to kind of be in my own zone and, you know, not worry about the outside world while I go through that process. And then when I come out the other end, um, you know, I'll talk about what that experience was like for me. Yeah. yeah so, so, well, Miriam, let me say, I appreciate, I know you have probably a lot of requests to come on. Uh, I know that um, every time you tell the story, it's re-traumatizing. I know it's both therapeutic and re-traumatizing. And I know that that's, that's a tough ask. Um, and I, I, I didn't want to make the ask, but I felt like you needed that. I, I wanted to hear your story. And uh, if you're going to tell it mm -hmm. to me, you might as well tell it to 650 of my closest and dearest friends who I think can all benefit from that. Um, and I know it's, it's been a, a powerful experience for me. Um, and, and, uh, obviously um, I'm on, I'm one of the board members for the SPTV foundation. We were able mm -hmm. to, through uh, John Popo on the go, we were able to get you some resources yeah. prior to the formation of that while that was while that was the work in progress. But hopefully yes. if you are an under the radar Scientologist and you're watching this now or if you join us um, via the replay crew at some point in the future, understand there mm -hmm. are resources. We were able to get Miriam resources. There are resources available if you're trying to find an out. Um, if you find yourself connecting with Miriam's story, 
um, to a point that it makes you uncomfortable listening to her story because it connects so deeply with you. You are going to be an excellent candidate for some of the resources and, and, uh, and, and mechanisms that are available, whether you're out of Scientology or you're on your way out or you're trying to find a way out. Understand that there are hundreds of us out here in the SPTV community who are ready uh, to help you. And so from all of us here at the Your Lawyer Friend Zach channel and the, the, the more than 600 people who've joined us for this video, Miriam, please um, accept our sincerest gratitude for coming and spending some time with us today. I know it's not what everybody mm -hmm. wants to do, and I know it's not an easy ask uh, for you to come on here, but I appreciate your, uh, your candor. And I also want to thank you for trusting me, trusting this platform as a space that you could tell your story in your way. I've never met you personally, um, but I've, tr I've worked really hard to try to create an environment where people can come on and be candid and with candor tell their story so that others can use that as an opportunity to better understand and become trauma informed as we deal with people who've experienced trauma in their everyday lives. Beautiful. That was so well said. Thank you. Thanks so much, Zach. Guys, we'll I will talk try again to, soon. Yeah, we will. Guys, I will try to, uh, I, I may, depending on what time I get get around to it, try to throw up a Q&A tonight. For those of you who have questions of me specifically, whether they're legal or my thoughts or whatever, I'll be happy to throw that chat up. I'm going to let Miriam go on about her business. She's got 10,000 things to do today, I'm sure. But stay tuned to the channel. Um, if you haven't already, make sure you, if you're one of my subscribers, make sure you subscribe to Miriam's channel as well. Um, and for those of you who are new here, hit that like button, hit the bell notification, subscribe to the channel, all the standard YouTube stuff. Um, it's, it's people like you, uh, out there in the audience today that make what I do possible and make these platforms available for Miriam to, um, provide education to those who, uh, did not grow up under her circumstances and to reach out to those under the sign or under the radar Scientologist or former Scientologist who are begging mm -hmm. for help. And don't know how to ask for it. So I appreciate everybody. Right. So I'm sorry, one thing. So my channel is at Against the Dark Arts is the handle. So it's Rage Against the Dark Arts. And my focus there is um, really on bringing a, a deeper understanding to what happened to the children. What was the child's experience in that? And um, of course, there are many children who experience that. But, um, you know, it, it does take a lot to come to a position where you can talk about these things freely and also even to even want to like I know that you know for some kids when they can you know when they grow up into adulthood and they could move away from it you know I want them to they should be free to live their lives however they wish to for me I've been kind of tethered to this thing because of the criminal cases and because of the, the very deeply traumatic and complicated like you know complex experiences um that I kind of have, yeah, have been a little bit inescapable for me. So, um, so while I'm kind of in that, I also just want to kind of do some good. And my focus there is on the rights of the children. So highlighting that, um, so to, to, um, yeah, bring understanding for rights for children and, um, also to highlight the issues with statute of limitations laws. You know, I think I think that's great. That's great advocacy. I've seen a few questions pop up about statutes of limitations, and we can save that for for, for a different video. But yeah. if, if if anything you've heard today, for the viewers out there, if you've heard anything today that you feel like needs to change from a statute of limitations perspective, the only way, the only way you can do that is you need to contact your lawmakers in the United here in the U.S. Call your House member or your senator, both at the state and the federal level. If you're in Australia, mm -hmm. I assume you, I think you guys have a parliament to call as a senator is a parliament. Anyway, call call your PMs mm -hmm. or your MP. Sorry, your MPs. Call your MPs. Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, contact your MPs and, and even I've got uh, we've got folks in the chat right now from the Netherlands, from uh, Amsterdam. We've got folks from from the UK. We've got folks from mainland Europe. So contact your representatives in the EU, contact your, your members of parliament, contact your legislators here in the US and demand change. And, and if you mm -hmm. need antidote, if you need and not antidotes, anecdotes, if you need examples, feel free to pull any of the content from at least from my channel. I'm sure Aaron would support that as well. And mm -hmm. uh don't don't stop until until you get an answer and the answer can't be i'll look into it um my dad served in the legislature in oklahoma and when a constituent would call him with a problem my dad would say i hear you i don't know what the solution is why don't you draft for me what you want the law to look like and then mm -hmm. i will work with the, with the legal staff to get it into the pro proper form and then you and i together will go advocate for this change and that's what mm -hmm. the viewers need to demand from their legislative representatives 
oh, well, I'm too busy. I don't know what that looks like. Cool. Good news. I have lots of resources where we've written a draft law for you. Let me meet with you mm -hmm. and explain this. And then you as my legislative representative and I, we can get together and we can go advocate for change. So the only way mm -hmm. this will change is if we, if, if people reach out and demand change to their legislative representation. Mm -hmm. The other thing as well, I'd add to that. So when you're saying like bring something forward and, uh, you know, this needs some more thought and attention, but, you know, one of the, one of the issues is that we, there are, so there are statute of limitations being lifted. So for example, in the state of California for child sexual abuse, um, and then that's change has been since 2023, but you had a brief look back window and it's like, not everyone can get you know, what, what I'm trying to say is like you have adults still suffering. I mean, I'm 39 years old and there's, you know, however many adults that are still living who were born before me who um, suffered tremendous um, sexual abuse when, within an institution. And when it occurs within an institution, it's compounded. There are compounded factors when it's in, in, in uh, inside a, um, especially a thought control group. I mean, it's compounded. Psychological harm is compounded. And when you have factors like language, when things were called the things that they were not, you know, you have all this difficulty that it, that's particular in Scientology, but can also be found in other groups, um, you know, and when you didn't have a support system, so even um, adults who experience child sexual abuse in um, orphanages, for example, or other uh, government care, foster homes, um, just the whole thing. I don't think that, that, you know, we've seen those the amount of cases come forward that it has actually occurred. And then there's also, you know, how do you get adequate representation? Like, uh, that's something that I'm experiencing now when you have such a, so what I'm talking about is like when they do have a look back window, I think they should always, when they change the statute law, they should always provide a look back window. I just think that it should be broader and it should allow for um, more of these, you know, cases to come forward and I understand that like you know there's a limit on what they can allow into the system in, in terms of what they are able to even keep up with because then there's also that balance of like okay well if you do that then you're probably going to be prolonging outcomes for more recent cases so I don't know that's why I say I don't I don't have that exactly right in my head of how that should look like I just think we just try and do the best that we can and the more we can improve the system um, but I just think that yeah, I don't know. I just feel for that's my current experience right now is still experience the loss and the anger and the frustration that comes with knowing that you don't have a criminal case when your perpetrator is still out there and has exacted horrific harms against you that you've struggled with for years and the organization participated in allowing him to continue to perpetrate those crimes. The organization covered it up. The organization silenced me. And I'm so left with this frustration and this anger. I mean, just, yeah. The, sometimes the thoughts that run through my head are, are not pretty. They're not pretty at all. They can be quite dark. Um, and so, yeah, that's, it just is what it is. And I'm not alone in that type of suffering absolutely it's, it's a conversation that that uh that you and i will continue to have that those of us in the sptv community will continue to have um mm -hmm. and it's it's it, it's it's a uh, it's an ongoing it's an ongoing mission um every day we get a little bit closer to finding resolution um domestically here the pressure on scientology has never been higher than it is now from a civil liability perspective and you get enough adverse outcomes from a civil liability perspective it gives the irs the grounds if they don't already have it which i can make a different argument for but um to, mm -hmm. to challenge the tax exempt status and and uh, and possibly and ultimately revoke the tax exempt status of uh, of the organization so Guys, listen. Um, it's it's. I've I've had a I've had a, a heck of a time with this interview. It's been uh, it's been. I don't want to say it's been a lot of fun. It's been uh, um, incredibly insightful. I don't. It's not not really the right word. In, uh, incredibly insightful. We will continue this discussion in a part two, and a part three, and a part four, if necessary, as many parts as is necessary for Miriam to tell her story the way she wants to tell it. So. Uh, I'm going to let you, you guys know, um, but I appreciate everybody who tuned in with us, whether you're from my community or from Miriam's community. I appreciate everybody being here. And as we say here uh, at, uh, at your lawyer friend, Zach, do me a favor. Be kind to someone. We'll talk to you guys soon. Love it. Thank you so much. See ya.